So this morning, uh, we are going to talk about decision making. And we've already seen some dis- significant decisions being made uh, through child dedication. And you will have an opportunity this morning to make several big decisions. Uh, one of them being a chance to sign up to volunteer uh, starting in the fall. And that's what everything in the lobby is of different positions, what people have found through volunteering. And you got a card on the way in. If not, there's ones by the door. You can just fill that out and drop it in the bucket if you'd like to be a part of that. Uh, but we'll get to all that in just a little bit. Uh, for right now, we're going to be in John chapter 10 this morning, John chapter 10. So if you have your Bible with you, if you open it up to that, if you don't have a Bible, you can use the BCM Bible in the pew in front of you. And that is our gift to you. Or you can follow along online at uh, bcnazarene.org slash gathering. And the teaching of Jesus that we're going to look at this morning uh, uses the metaphor of a shepherd and a sheep pen. So I just want to explain this real briefly because this is obviously not a common metaphor to us today, unless if those of you who walked in late were late because you were tending your sheep. <laughs> no? Okay. So uh, so what would commonly happen in their day and age is there would be a common courtyard in which all the shepherds would gather their sheep together. And so all the sheep would come in this common place, this fenced in area, because everybody didn't have the means and it made more economical sense to store them all together. And so there was a gate within the courtyard. Um, and so the gate would be there. There would often be a gatekeeper uh, to keep the sheep in the courtyard. And so what the shepherds would do, while there were sheep of all their neighbors within this one sheep pen area, the the shepherd would come out and they would call the sheep by name and the sheep were familiar with the shepherd's voice and so when it was their shepherd who called them they would come forth together now uh, this passage uses the metaphor of a gate we don't have many sheep pens today and so we're going to use the metaphor of a door so then the doors that you see around and that'll explain that as we go so this is John chapter 10 and this is what I'm going to invite you to do I'm going to invite you to stand as uh, we read this together Let's get some of you are up to it. You're ready to go. Energetic. Thank you. I'm going to need more of that this morning. The rest of you will get there. John chapter 10, and this is verse 1 through 14. Jesus speaking. He says this, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Now it says this, those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. Doesn't that make you feel good? I guess it should make you feel really good. Like, that would be me. If I was in the Bible stories, it was like... And then Kevin asked a question, because he had no idea what Jesus was talking about. So they didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. He says, I tell you the truth. I am the gate. Now remember, we're using door, but he says, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. And then he says it again to set it really, really deep to make sure we don't forget. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Now, when we talk about decision making, you may for a second go, what on earth does that have to do with decision making? And the answer is everything. So turn to your neighbor and say everything and then you can have a seat. 
So today, as we're talking about decisions, uh, we are going to use the metaphor of a door. And again, Jesus says gate, we're going to use door because door is more common in our day. I'll just trust you to make the association as we go throughout the passage. And so this is what I want you to see initially on, is that when we think we're making decisions, what we think that we're doing is we're going to a destination. And we picture the different destinations that we're going to get to. And so when I go throughout my house, I understand every door leads to a new destination. Every door leads to another room within the house. And so as we go throughout all of our life, Everything that we're doing, be it job, be it relationships, be it finances, be it spare time, be it next Netflix show that we're going to watch, or should we actually pick a next Netflix show or spend all of our time just searching through all of Netflix at all the possible shows that we could watch and waste all our time instead of watching anything? That's not really, it's not like it's that much more productive to watch a show. But for all those decisions, it's a door. We make the decision, and it leads to a new destination. Now, here is the thing that we all think, is we think, when it comes to the decisions that we're making, that our decisions are made on a conglomeration of our logic and our desires. And so we're trying to say, hey, if this is where I want to be in life, if this is where I see my life headed, if this is the future that I want to be a part of, I need to use all the logic I have for all the opportunities that are stretched out before me and make the wise choice to get to the destination that I want to go to, right? And so when you like pick your career, or when you picked your significant relationships in your life, or when you picked your next pair of shoes, whatever it is, everything that you pick, you go, hey, this is the life that I want to have. This is the thing that will get me to that life. And so I picked this to get the life that I want to have. This is how we think we make decisions. But it's not actually how we make decisions. Because the reality is this is fear plays a far more significant role in our decision making than any of us would like to admit. And so what we wanna do is this, is we wanna say, I want to make this decision so that I will find something on the other side. By making this decision and walking through this door, which it's on like legs, so I can't actually open the door, just to be clear. Say, so like, I'm gonna find what's on the other side of this. But on this side of the door, before we make the decision, the reality is, is fear plays a far more significant role than any of us realize. So let me give you an example of this. And this is going to be a horrific example that I just want to give you like prepped because this is over the top. This is extreme. It actually involves cannibals. And I promise you, this is the last illustration I will give this morning that involves cannibals. Okay? Just so good. We're good. So uh, so I don't know how many of you had to or forced to. How many of you have read the book Moby Dick? Who has read the book? Oh, wow, this is good. You are a far more studious crowd than the 9 a.m. folks because they're like three. I'm like, what? Okay, there we go. And so uh, the, the novel Moby Dick is actually loosely based on a true story. The true story is about the ship titled the Essex. The Essex sailed in the 17th century. What took place with the Essex is while it was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, when it was in the spot of water that it was virtually as far from any land as it could possibly be, it was hit by a whale and damaged significantly. There were holes in the ship and other damage that could not possibly be repaired, and the ship sunk fairly quickly. There were 30 sailors aboard this ship, and they quickly boarded three small whale boats that they had, 10 in each boat, and they survived the crashing of the ship. They spent the next day or two gathering any supplies that they could possibly find, food or anything else that had been on the ship and boarding them on their boats, and then they pulled all their boats together and they needed to make a decision. Now, if this happened today, it would be terrifying. <laughs> but this happened in the year 1619. And so there is no, like, there's no self-service, not that there's self-service today in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but you can imagine, like, with their rudimentary, like, navigational equipment and everything else, this was a terrifying ordeal. And so they begin having conversations and trying to figure out what to do. And they realized they had three possible options of where to go. There were a set of islands. They were about 1,200 miles away. The Hawaiian Islands 
were about 13, 1400 miles away, they guessed. And then there was also a possibility of catching a current and going to a southern part of Africa that was more like 2,000 miles away. And so they started to weigh these options back and forth. They go, okay, we have these three different options. We don't exactly know where we are, but we are relatively sure of where we are, so what are we going to do? The problem is, is there was fear associated with each decision. The mile, the Hawaiian Islands, at the time of the year that they were in, it was their storm season. And so they were very, very confident that there was almost no chance that they were actually going to be able to make it to the Hawaiian Islands, that their, their ships that they were in right now would be sunk because it was just the bad time of year for their storms. As they go, well, of course, they're going to go to the islands that are 1,200 miles away. There was a rumor at the time that there were cannibals who lived on the islands 1,200 miles away. The problem is, is sailing to the southern part of Africa, they knew, would stretch their supplies and their food rations far beyond what they currently had. And so they come together and they go, what do we do? Do we risk our ships sinking because of storms? Do we risk starving to death? Or do we risk the possibility of cannibals? Now, if you would take those three decisions in context, the reality is this. If you would like weigh them back and forth and go, what's the, what's the probability of those things? So today we have a risk formula. If you're unfamiliar with the risk formula, insurance companies use it all the time. The risk equation is this. It is risk equals probability of an event happening times the loss of that event. And so if we would take this scenario right here with the ship Essex, it would say, hey, what is, what is the probability of there being cannibals on the island? Not great. It's probably not that likely that there are cannibals. But what is the potential loss if there are cannibals? Pretty bad, right? Could we all agree? Like that's kind of worst case scenario possible. And so they go, they hear those different things. And then we would say a different context. Hey, what is, the, what is the probability that we are going to run out of food if we sail for Africa? Certain. 100%. What is the loss from that event? Well, we die. Now, this is what we think, is we think when we make decisions, we're running that formula all the time. But we're not. Because this is what happens, is the fear that is the most clear and vivid and terrifying to us always gets a hold of our heads. The fear that we feel the most always takes over our brains and our desires and steers us away from that. And so they get together their little boats and they go, what should we do? And they said, ain't no way I'm going to the island with cannibals. That is not going to happen. And so they start sailing for Africa. Now, I'm going to tell you, this story is going to get really, really dark in a hurry. <laughs> so about two months into their sailing, they run out of food. And so they start drawing straws for which of the remaining living sailors would become the nourishment for the other sailors. When they were rescued, not far off of Africa, a couple weeks later, there were only 10 or 15 of them that had still survived. And all the ones who had survived had resorted to their own form of cannibalism. I told you, it was dark and dreary that what had happened is they became their greatest fear. Now, I tell you that story not to make you depressed and morbid and grossed out and never want to eat lunch again, okay? That's not the reason for it. I tell you that story to illustrate this to you, is that we think that when we're making decisions in our life, that we are running that formula and we're going, hey, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna do the wise thing. Yeah, that's never gonna happen. We're running the formula. We're figuring out based upon our desires, based upon our logic, what's the best thing to do. The reality is this, is that before you make that decision, fear plays the most significant role in your decision-making ability than any other factor. And so let me give you an example. So uh, 
This has just happened this past Sunday, and I got permission to make sure I could share this story. I don't often do that. Uh, this story isn't about Bethany, because I just kind of have general permission, and then reprimand later on if I overstep the line. So you understand how that goes. And so, uh, so I sent a text out to my small group, and I said, hey, this Sunday, we need to have a discussion about the form and shape of our group moving into the future, because our group has been meeting for a little bit over a year. And I just realized, hey, as it comes to the future of our small group, I want to be intentional. And so the reality is we're probably not all still going to be meeting when we're 70 years old. And so I want to make sure that the steps that we take in the future, that they're intentional and they're not accidental. And so I just sent out a text and I said, hey, this Sunday I want to have a discussion about the form and shape of our group heading into the future. About five minutes later, someone pops into my office and they go, hey, so is our group splitting up? I was like, no. No, I just, I just want to talk about it. And they're like, so, so, you're, so you're canceling our group, right? <laughs> no, no, I, I would have just sent that. I would have just said, hey, our group is done. This Sunday's the last Sunday. And so we get around. I got like two other calls or texts that week. They say, so, so are, you, are you breaking up our group? It's like, guys, no, I'm not. And so our group gets together on Sunday night. And normally as we're gathering together, you kind of got to like reel everyone in. Like adults turn into toddlers when they get in small groups together. It's like, oh, you come in, come on, come on. Everybody come in. Good, good, good. Quit pulling her hair. Come on. Here we go. Let's go everybody together. And normally it's just like conversation all over the place and people telling stories. And uh, just as this is a small tip for those of you group leaders, if you can't get your group settled down, just ask for prayer requests. That's what you do. It's perfect. Everybody gets quiet right away. <laughs> like, da, 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 da. does anyone have any prayer requests? <gasps> and so, uh, so we go through. It. But like this week, everybody in group, everybody's tense and quiet. And so everybody sits down and like people's eyes are starting to well up with tears already. And I'm just like, hey, so I said I'd like to talk about the future of our group. We're not canceling group. That's not, and they're like, oh, I thought for sure. I thought this was the last week, and I love you guys so much, and I thought this was it. Now, here's the thing that I show you. That's not cannibalism. It's not, but it is this. It's saying, hey, before I know what's on the other side of this door, fear plays an irrational role in affecting my decisions and my ability to move into the future. And so this is what's happened. I'm going to flip the side of the door. Before you have moved through the door, before you have made the decision, the reality is this, is you are inordinately affected by the things that have gone wrong in your life. So this is what Jesus says about it. John chapter 10, verse one. He says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. And so this is what you need to know. There are thieves and robbers in your life. There are people who want to use you. There are people who want what you have more than they want a relationship with you. There are people who care more about their opinion than your value. There are people who are more than happy to lose the relationship to prove to you that they are right. Those people are thieves and robbers. Those people do not have your best interest at heart. And what happens is this, is you go through a couple of those situations and environments, and then you come to the point in time where you have to make a decision, where you have to move through, and all of a sudden we remember all the times that the people who used us, the people who wanted what we have instead of a relationship with us, and the people who cared about their opinion more than our personal value, and all the ways that scarred us and affected us. And so when it comes to the next time that we have to make a decision, we stay right here. And we're paralyzed. And we don't move. And we don't do anything. And so it comes down to the next thing. We go, hey, what are you going to do about your job? What are you going to do about your relationship? And we go, I'm... And we'll tell people our plans, we'll tell people our ideas, but we're not doing anything. Because what has happened in the moment is fear has locked us into a place in which we can't move forward. Now, here's the reality. It's for some of you, that's where you are right now. And when someone asks you what's next or what's coming up, you have done an amazing job of putting forth 
well-articulated plans and ideas about your future. But when it actually comes to how do you feel, what are you going to do, you're stuck right here. But I have good news for you. Jesus says this. He says it twice to make sure we're abundantly clear about what's going on. He says, there are thieves and robbers. But he says, I am the good shepherd. He says, no, no, no. There, there are people who will use you. That's not me. I am the good shepherd. That is, that is who I am. And he articulates to us exactly what that means. This is what Jesus says in John 10, verse 10. He says this, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. He's saying, this is why I'm here. I am here so you can have a life that is rich and satisfying to you. I am here so that you'll have a life that is abundant, that is meaningful, that is significant, that is fulfilling. And so many times we get this off that we think a relationship with Jesus is about what we have to give to him about what he wants from us. And what he is making so abundantly clear in this moment is he's saying, no, 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 it's about what I want for you. It's about what I want to give to you. The reality is this, there are other people who will come in and they will seek to take. I am here to give. I want you to have a life that you could only dream about. I want you to have relationships that are life-giving to you. That doesn't mean they're never hard. But I want you to have relationships that are fulfilling to you instead of constantly draining. I am here so that you will have a rich and satisfying life. And so this is the thing that we always do in that moment when it comes to our decisions. We go, hey, so if that's what Jesus wants is for us to have a rich and satisfying life, then, then which decision do I need to make to get there? And we'll kind of go, okay, I've got all these options. So if I choose this career, what's on the other side? Is that a rich and satisfying life? If I choose this relationship with this person, what's there? Is that a rich and satisfying life? And we'll come to those, and this is how we have filtered down decision-making in Christianity in the 21st century. And we use four letters, and it doesn't make any sense why it is this. And some of you may have grown up, and you've worn these bracelets at one point in time. And we ask, what would Jesus do? And this is the apex of decision-making in our faith today. And it's really hard, isn't it? Did, any, did anyone have the bracelet? I had the bracelet. It was blue. <laughs> yeah. And so we come in there and it's like, isn't it, isn't it like so hard when you actually get in the moment to go, what would Jesus do? Taco Bell. <laughs> Gordita Chalupa. Gordita Chalupa. I was like, man, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Go to the movies. What would Jesus do? I don't think Jesus ever went to the movies. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do in this moment. And it goes like every single relationship, every single decision, trying to filter it through this perspective of like, hey, if Jesus was here, what would he have me do? And what we're doing in that moment, even though it seems spiritual, even though it seems helpful, even though it seems godly, we're treating Jesus as advice giver instead of source of life. And every single time we come into something, it's like, hey, so Jesus, what would you do here? What, what would you have in this moment? And he just becomes someone who becomes our consultant. Now, I understand. I understand the motivation and desire behind it. Within it, we're trying to live a life that would honor God. But it is not what Jesus calls us to do in our decision making because we're constantly trying to predict the scenario that would make Jesus the most happy. We're constantly trying to make the decision going, hey, if Jesus had to make these decisions, what would he do? But that's not what Jesus tells us to do. This is what he says in John 10, verse 7. He says, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. Turn to your neighbor. Say, the gate. Now understand the metaphor that we're using today. Turn to your neighbor. Say, the door. The door. There we go. You got the emphasis too. This is what he says. This, I, please, please, please do not miss this. We look at it and we go, which one of these would Jesus have me choose? 
Which one of these scenarios and possibilities will, will lead to the life that Jesus wants me to have? He goes, no, no, no. I'm the door. I, I'm the door. It's, it's not about what's behind the door. It's not about how all the scenarios come out. It's, it's your decision is me. M make your decision me. And then it'll lead to the life that you have wanted to have. It's not about playing out all the scenarios and going, man, if I've got these three job offers, if Jesus was picking between this job, which job would Jesus choose? I'm a major in trying to pick my major in college. Which major would Jesus pick? Like, he was a craftsman that's already, that's already been decided for you. I don't know if Wright State has that or not, okay? And you go, this, this isn't working for me. And so he makes it so simple. He goes, no, 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 understand. Make the decision me. Make the decision me. So let me explain this. I was having a conversation with a young man in our church recently, and uh, this young man was interested in going into full-time ministry. He was interested in pursuing the calling of being a pastor. And so we were just kind of talking about all that entailed with that, what that would look like, what he'd have to go through, training, experience, all those different kinds of things. And so as we're going through these different things, I just kind of pull back aside and I say, hey, listen, here's the deal. This is what I want you to know. You may be choosing this right now for the wrong reasons. It was very blunt. I said, hey, here's the deal. You may be choosing this because you want to emulate a model in your life. You want to emulate someone who you look up to who's a part of this. Uh, you may be choosing this because your faith is newer and you're really excited about, which is a great thing, but then you automatically assume that this means, that means this is what you're supposed to do with your life. I said, if either of those are the case, that's okay. But this is what I want you to see. If you make your goal to be in ministry, then you may fail. And you may get to a spot in your life that that is not the right decision. And if you have set that as your goal, then in that moment, you'll feel like a failure. It says, so do this instead. Make your goal to follow Jesus. And, and if, if you just say, hey, I, I'm going to follow Jesus, then if ministry isn't the right thing for you, and, and you hop out of it and you go do something else, you are still closer in your relationship with Jesus than you were before. If your decision is to do what Jesus calls you to do, then, then you really can't pick incorrectly because everything you do leads you closer to Jesus. That's what he's saying right here. He's saying, I'm the door. When, when you're making decisions, make your decision me, and it'll always lead to the life that you want to have. It'll always lead to the spot that you want to be in. Let me make this as simple as I possibly can. If we could take the filter for the decisions that we make, and if we would make the filter for the decisions that we make, simply, does this lead me closer to Jesus? That's it. Does this lead me closer to Jesus? Does this enhance my relationship with Jesus? Does this increase my passion for Jesus? Does this lead me into a better knowledge of who Jesus is? Then no matter what you do, you're on the right path. You can apply this to other areas of your life as well. Those of you who are married or significant relationships, if you would say, hey, instead of trying to figure out this whole balance in our marriage and our kids and our job and our activities and everything else, if you would just say, hey, I'm just going to use one criteria. Will this increase the health of my marriage? Will this lead me and my partner or my spouse or my boyfriend or my girlfriend or whoever that is, will it lead us closer together? then no matter what you choose, you're on the right path. And that's what Jesus is telling us in this moment. He's saying, no, no, make me the door. Don't try to constantly figure out what's behind the door. Make me the door. And that's what we always want to do. You're going to go, okay, so my decision is Jesus, and then we spend most of our time kind of peeking around the door, and we go, what's, what's over there? What's that? Like Jesus said, I should do this with my finances. Are the people who are doing that happy? They liking it? Jesus said, this is how to live my life. They, they having a good time? Hmm? And here's the reality. There's some areas of your life that you can peek around the door. Uh, that's one of the things that we wanted to show you with volunteering here at BCN, is we asked a whole bunch of people, we said, hey, through volunteering, what have you found? 
What did you discover? What did you experience? And I'll be honest with you, we had no idea the responses we were going to get. Like, we didn't know if the posters we were going to put up there would be like, I found goldfish stuck at the bottom of my shoes from working in the nursery. Like, we didn't know what was going to come up. And all these people gave these responses of like, I found purpose, I found meaning, I found community, I found hope, I found my calling. Like all these people had all these different stories to say like, hey, because I went through this, I could have I been on the side of fear and not done anything with it. But because I moved through the door, I found something significant on the other side. And so there are some areas of your life and your faith that you can do that. But here's the hard part, is there's a whole bunch of them that you can't. There's a whole bunch of spots in your life that you don't get to peek around the door and see how it's working out for everyone else. And you just have to take that step on your own. And so scripture says this. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. And how often we have exchanged that for observe and assume, right? No, 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 I don't, I don't want to learn it through experience I'd rather do a case study of everyone else to see how it's working out for them. And so this is what I liken it to. Uh, I am, if I had, I'm not going to say box of chocolates because that'll make this a Forrest Gump metaphor and I want us to stay far away from that. So this is not about a box of chocolates, it's about a rectangle of chocolates. There we go. And so uh, if there are one of those in our house, uh, I am, I just like waste 70% of it because you're very aware by now from illustrations previously that I have a very simple palate that of a seven-year-old, and that's fine with me. I can handle it. And so when I pick one, what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to do, what adults do, is they taste and see. They bite into it and see, are pleasantly surprised. Or some of you, you're just like daredevils, and you just pop that whole sucker in your mouth, and you're just like, I'm just, I'm just going to eat it. That's not what I do. Because it is too risky for me to end up with coconut in my mouth. And that's not an adventure I'm willing to go on because it takes like five minutes to pick all the pieces of coconut off and it's just like everywhere right away and I'm like, ugh. And so this is what I do. I I pick it up and I'll just take a real little bite around the edge. What's in there? Cherry, back in the box. (laughs) Coconut, no thank you. Save that for another day. So if they're ever at my house and there's a box of chocolates around, you may want to pick it up and inspect the bottom beforehand before you bite into it because I may have previously attempted to eat it. <laughs> but that's what I do because I don't, I don't want to just jump in. And this is how most of us attempt to live faith. Is when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, we just want to go, just a little. Jesus said, trust me with your life just a little. And you cannot see that the Lord is good until you've said yes. You you cannot see what God has for you until you have actually walked through the door and you've chosen him in different areas of your life. Now, I want to press something upon you just briefly. And this is for those of you who have followed Jesus for a significant portion of your life. For those of you who aren't there, we'll get to you in just a second, okay? You're not missing out. For those of you who have followed Jesus for a significant portion of your life, this is what I have found. Is there a tendency when we talk about saying yes to Jesus to assume that because we have done that before, then that is what we are doing. And all of a sudden, saying yes to Jesus and following him is our history but not our reality. You you don't just say yes once. It is one big yes, followed by hundreds of thousands of smaller yeses throughout your life. I had a good friend who ended up playing in church in northern Kentucky, and I asked him the story. How did you get to that spot where you were willing to do that? And he said, when I was a teenager, I was sitting in a service, and the pastor was saying, will you give God an unconditional yes? That's a big question. That was the theme of his message. Will you give God an unconditional yes that if God leads you some, your your answer is already yes. You're not trying to play out the scenarios. You're not working through your fears. It is automatically a yes. And he said, I was a teenager and I said yes. He said, two decades later, I was sitting in a similar service 
And I had been wrestling with this idea of planning a church in this area, and I felt pressed upon me this question, do I still have your yes? He said, I hadn't thought about that for 20 years. But all of a sudden, in a moment, I knew that I had to act in order for God to still have my yes. If you cannot remember the last time you stepped out and took a little risk of faith, then you're living in fear. If you can't remember the last time that God led you in a specific area and you had to work through that a little bit and you had to fight through that, but you had to say, yes, Jesus, my decision is you, then what has happened is fear has clouded your thinking and you're stuck on the other side of the door, not able to walk through. And so my encouragement to you today is don't just give God one yes. Give him the one yes and then thousands after that because his promise is he is the good shepherd who will give you a rich and satisfying life. Now, for those of you who have not made that decision, I want to invite you to do that today. And here's the reality. Is there are thousands of questions that you don't have the answer to. And you will never have the answer to until you start following Jesus. And so it is one big yes of saying, God, I understand that you have promised that you want what is best for me, and I don't even know what that looks like right now, but I'm willing to trust you with that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to invite you, if you would, would you stand this morning? And if you have never accepted Jesus at the center of your life, we're going to pray a prayer right now today. I'm going to say a few words and you're going to repeat after me right now. And this prayer places Jesus at the center of your life. It is accepting his forgiveness for your sins and his, your, his invitation to a relationship with him. And so as I say these words, I'm going to invite you to say them out loud if you would like to make that decision today. And you will not be alone because everyone who has already made that decision We'll be saying these words out loud with you as an encouragement to you and as a confirmation of our own faith. In the book of Romans, it says this, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. So if you have never made that decision, and all those who have already have, I invite you to repeat this prayer after me. Lord, I believe, Lord, I believe that, Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world that he was raised from the dead to forgive my sins. I receive your grace by faith. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen. Hey, we want to celebrate with you right now if you made that decision today.